Welcome to Tomorrow Orbit 12.22. I can't even believe it's 22 already. I've got Jared with me. I am Carrie Ann. And today we are interviewing none other than the Astrobotic CEO, John Thornton. Uh, John actually previously was on our show in Orbit uh, 8.12. So if you'd like to go back and see that episode, that was a great episode. Uh, it was not in the studio. So for those of you who have uh, joined us in the last couple of years, it uh, might be a different experience for you. Mm, yeah. uh, but we're really happy to have uh, John back. And uh, just for those of you who don't know, Astrobotic used to be a Google Lunar X Prize uh, competitor and has actually moved on and gotten a lot more money to do a lot of other things. So, <laughs> so John, welcome back to the show. It's really lovely to have you. And I'm really excited to talk about- oh, um, thank you. Yeah, thank you. About all the things that uh, you've done since the last time we've had you on the show. But uh, just to lay some groundwork, if you would like to tell us a little bit about yourself for those of you who have not seen you before, so we can get to know you a little bit better. Yeah, thanks for uh, having me on the show. Really excited to be here again. Um, I'm the CEO of Astrobotic, and we are building a DHL-like delivery service to take payloads up to the surface of the moon. Um, so we actually have 28 payloads signed up so far, uh, flying on the first mission. And the big news is that, that NASA uh, added 14 uh, to that manifest um, with a contract of $79.5 million. So we are ready to go. That's amazing. Nice. I like how you just randomly put out the $79.5 million. Like, that's a cool... I mean, it is a cool number. Don't get me wrong, because it's it's a little bit more <laughs> than I think most people uh, were expecting to hear. Uh, generally speaking, that's so funny. Um, so that's a little bit about you. A little bit about Astrobotic. Can you tell us a little bit about how, like, what the founding story is behind Astrobotic itself? We got started 12 years ago. Originally, it was to pursue the Google Lunar X Prize, and we started as a more of a, a project than a company. Um, and, but what we quickly realized when pursuing the prize is that we needed something more. Uh, the prize wasn't enough to cover the costs. We needed something that could um, create more revenue, create more uh, money to make the mission actually occur. And that's, that's when we started to look at business. Um, so about six years ago, uh, I transitioned from the engineering side and the business side, and we, we refocused the company on payload sales. Um, so since then, we've been building the market and uh, and making sales in that market, and we're we're world leading um, uh, now. So it's been a, been a long time coming, when, and the uh, you know the prize is is no longer in effect; it's since expired. But I think it's really uh, it's done its job because we exist, and there's other companies that are out there building a lunar delivery market. So, John, uh, what about Astrobotic attracted you to to come and work for them? Well, going to the moon. That's that's the big one. It's fair. Um, so I, I had an opportunity to uh, to go work for for a big aerospace company, um, or I could take my moonshot with Astrobotic. And uh, uh, originally, when I joined Astrobotic, the plan was to land on the moon two years after I joined. Hmm. Um, so twelve years later, um, we are now two years out from our moon landing. That's amazing. That's really <laughs> that's really cool. Uh, it's kind of funny though. I appreciate that you uh, have a sense of humor about uh, about that. Just generally speaking, I think a lot of Google Lunar X Prize teams were like, "Oh yeah, this is you know no problem. We we've got this." And uh, you know, sadly, we've seen what's happened. But there have been a lot of companies like yours that have gone on to other things, and I think that's really fantastic. And that's kind of what the X Prize was really intended to do, mm -hmm. um, to do anyway. Uh, yeah. Uh, so how would you describe, if you don't mind, the way that the Google Lunar X Prize or GLXP accelerated or sort of kickstarted the company's development itself? I think the most important thing that Google X Prize did is it created a platform to talk about lunar delivery and, and talk about lunar uh, emissions. Mm. Um, if you are a small startup in Pittsburgh with just a handful of folks um, uh, going around saying you're going to land on the moon, um, that's uh, that's kind of hard to do, and, and people will look at you funny. <laughs> totally. um, but the Google X Prize gave us the platform to to talk about that, and to other people talked about it. And it was the beginnings of of uh, you know the, of a promising industry and a market very very early. Um, but you know, it gave us that platform to get started. Um, so then over the years, we were able to show our technical capability uh, by winning uh, you know, three of the milestone prizes in the Google X Prize. We, we had numerous NASA contracts at that point to date. Um, uh, so it gave us a platform to get started and, and talking points and uh, uh, you know, a, a place to tell the world about what we're up to. That's awesome. 
Yeah, and when you guys were deep in the Google Lunar X Prize, what was that environment like? Um, was it, were you guys sort of like very, was it like a cordial competition amongst everybody in the prize? Uh, or was it sort of what I would expect aerospace to be where it's like, you know, you're friendly with each other, but you're also keeping, you know, you're, you're very close to yourself, very secretive mm. about what you may be working on. I think it transitioned over time. In the beginning, it was uh, very secretive and, and a little bit more competitive. Um, but over time, people quickly realized that it was uh, necessary to be working together. Um, and we actually took a, a unique step in offering other XPRIZE teams to fly with us. Uh, and, and in fact, we have a, a, a couple signed up for our, our mission today that will be flying with us to, to the surface of the moon. Um, so we, we actually took the opportunity um, of the XPRIZE and treated it as a, a market opportunity uh, for, for sales and, and to build up the, the payload sales pipeline necessary to, to fly to, to the moon. That's awesome. Actually, that ties in really great with one of the questions coming in from our chat room. Astro YYZ says, who do you partner with to launch payloads? Speaking of partnerships. So the partnerships for, uh, for getting to the moon are, are really critical. I mean, one of the biggest challenges we have as a company is, uh, you know, over the last 12 years is convincing people that it's possible to fly and land on the moon, which has only been accomplished by superpowers. Um, so that's where the partners are so key to, to show that, hey, this small startup in Pittsburgh can actually get this done because they are partnered with Airbus, uh, you know, great power in, in the, uh, the space industry and, and really world-renowned uh, experience. Mm -hmm. We're partnered with NASA through the Catalyst program where their engineers are working on our lander. Um, we're partnered with Dynetics uh, to, uh, to build our propulsion system. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're, we're currently partnered with ULA to, to fly our, our lander uh, to space to get out to, to the surface of the moon. Um, so it's really that partnership um, that is key for building the credibility, building our story, building the technical capability to make something like this happen. So, um, you know, as we as we found out, you know, uh, unfortunately, the big accomplishments, the the big goals that were set uh, for you to win in the Google Lunar X Prize, unfortunately, nobody was able to to do it in the amount of time. And I know Google kept extending it and everything. Um, but even with that passing, the expiration of it, um, what were some of the things that Astrobotic learned from that? What were some of the things that Astrobotic had to take and kind of adapt? yourselves for? I think we learned a lot about the market. I mean, we, we were focused on payload sales and building up this uh, this lunar payload delivery market. Um, and what we learned by uh, selling back to other, other XPRIZE teams is how to build the business to go to the moon. Um, how is it going to uh, happen? How, how do you have the customer interactions? What do the customers expect? Um, and how do you build the service that's going to satisfy their needs? Um, so we really focused uh, our, our service from the very get-go uh, on that delivery uh, objective. And the XPRIZE gave us a perfect platform to talk to the other teams to understand what their needs were, what their um, uh, concerns might be, uh, uh, and, and try to address them and, and really build the company from the ground up uh, as a customer-centric uh, company for, for delivery. That's, that's awesome. I really like that. There's... Um... <laughs> There's a question coming in uh, from our chat room. Uh, actually, it's from our YouTube uh, our YouTube uh, channel um, where Stephen Porter is sounding a little bit harsh, I, I will admit, but it is an interesting question, uh, which is to say, why are you using 60s technology and design instead of moving forward? Hey. Uh, which I, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think is maybe a little bit on the harsher side, uh, but at the same time, like I, I think, um, Anybody who is not uh, actively in the industry, and even some people who are, I suppose, sometimes can look at a lot of these designs and they all sometimes sort of look alike. And they look like some of the stuff that came out in the 50s and 60s. And at the time it was brand new and nobody had been to the moon yet. And so it was really cool and it looked really futuristic. And now anything else that you see after that sort of, if it's even remotely reminiscent, um, even the uh, lander that, um, uh, uh, Blue Origin just recently put out also has a relatively similar shape and design aesthetic to it. Uh, so I think that's kind of where this is sort of coming from uh, <laughs> as a question, as opposed to being as harsh as maybe it sounds. Uh, but what would you say is is there like a good reason for that? Like I, you know, I don't design. I'm not an engineer. Can you explain to me why your lander maybe doesn't aesthetically look that drastically different and like the stuff that we maybe dreamed of while going uh, to the moon and a really cool. <laughs> 
bleak sort of situation. Yeah, yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, I, I think I think the biggest reason, uh, not not to be glib about it, but the biggest reason is that physics hasn't changed since the '60s. Sure. Um, <laughs> so the the fundamental you know ways that you solve the problems are are the same. So so some of the some of the technology is literally dropped in place uh, from the '60s. So for example, the um, the landing legs uh, have to absorb the impact on landing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and in order to do that, you want to absorb the impact but not bounce. Um, so you can't put a spring damper uh, system in there like you might have in your car suspension, but you, you need something that could uh, absorb the energy and not rebound. So the, the Apollo uh, engineers created a, a, a system of crushable honeycomb, mm -hmm. um, which is a super uh, affordable, easy way to do exactly that, to absorb that impact and, and not rebound. Um, so we are using the exact same system uh, in, in our lander. Um, a lot of the components um, that uh, fly the spacecraft are uh, you know, same basic ideas that, that were in the 60s, but they are um, 50 and 60 years advanced compared to where they were back then. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, uh, the program, the, the computer, for example, that flew Apollo out to the moon was you know, uh, on order of as, as powerful as pocket calculator. Um, our, uh, our processors are much, much, much more powerful, orders of magnitude more powerful, and that enables the spacecraft to be much more autonomous uh, in its descent down to the surface of the moon. Um, so I think you know that there's a lot of parts that are, are similar, and we're building on that foundation, um, but the, the industry as a whole has advanced dramatically. Sure. Um, if, you, if you think about it, I mean, during the Apollo era, they were creating components for the very first time, and now we have a $360 billion industry uh, worldwide to send things up to the up, up to space, um, and uh, only a quarter of that is government spending. Yeah, no, that makes so sense. So there's there's vast quantities of components that are available off the shelf uh, that can be integrated and, and, and are very well proven. Totally. Yeah, and you know a lot of uh, sort of in the same vein as as uh, the question that we just had from mm -hmm. Stephen, right? Yeah. Um, is that people will often say, you know, we went to the moon back in the '60s and '70s, so. Why are we going back? I mean, like, it's what's Apollo eleven fiftieth this year, right? Yes. Next week. Yes, and uh, and and you know, even towards the end of the Apollo program, people were saying that as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess sort of the kind of throw Stephen's question around a little bit as well again, <laughs> which is sort of uh, why the, why the focus on the moon? Like, what is so exciting about the moon that Astrobotic decided to to start designing landers for it? When we went to the moon 50 years ago, the objective was essentially a flags and footprints program. Mm -hmm. It was to show the rest of the world who had the biggest rockets, to show the rest of the world who had the best technology. Um, and uh, you know, the U.S. accomplished what they needed to accomplish during, during a Cold War. Um, so now the objective to go back to the moon is different. Uh, instead of uh, accomplishing a, a national priority like that for, for defense, um, now the priority is what can we use the moon uh, for to uh, advance our species here on Earth and also uh, further exploration in our solar system. Um, so one of the uh, first uh, things I point out in, in this is that the fuel can be uh, used to refuel spacecraft. The, the moon can become a, um, a fueling station. Uh, so you could have uh, water at the poles of the moon, for example. You can split that in oxygen and hydrogen and condense that, and that's rocket fuel. So you can use that fuel to refuel spacecraft to go back and forth from the moon and to uh, refuel spacecraft to go deeper into space. You can dramatically reduce the cost to get to Mars, for example, if you can refuel at the moon. Um, and the moon is also our nearest neighbor. It's our practice ground. It's the place where we need to learn to live off the land. Uh, where we've spent 40 of the last 60 years of space living in space with astronauts, we've only spent two weeks uh, on and around the moon. So we don't know how to live on another planetary body. Um, and it makes sense to practice that and figure out the technologies, uh, figure out how to create components from the, from the local terrain, how to mine uh, materials and potentially use that for uh, creating components uh, on the moon and for uh, future destinations and potentially bringing some of that uh, uh, mining um, output back here to Earth to, to potentially uh, reduce our impact on, on the environment here on Earth. Oh, awesome. I love that. I didn't know that part. I want to get back to that for sure, but what you just said also leads in really well to another question that we have coming out of the chat room uh, from Johnny Spacer saying, uh, does Astrobotic have plans beyond robotic missions, i.e. like crewed lander vehicles, et cetera? 
So we, we are a space robotics company at the core. Um, so we are building robotic delivery services to go to the surface moon, and we're, we're taking uh, various robots with us. Um, so there's going to be robotic exploration, robotic science, and robotic development of the, the lunar resources. Um, when humans go to the surface of the moon, robots are going to play a key role as well. They're going to be the scouts. They're going to be the ones to, to figure out where to land. They're going to be the ones that are enabling and helping the astronauts along the way. Um, you could imagine, uh, you know, uh, teleoperated uh, robots uh, being driven out and finding the spots where the humans need to go and explore. Um, so there's a, a, a whole array of applications that, that robots fit hand in glove with them, um, with human explorers. All right. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So, um, so speaking of landers, you guys are working on a lander um, to send to the moon. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the story of that lander? Like where, where did that begin and, and how did you go through your different designs that you've gone with it? Yeah, our lander development started uh, 12 years ago at the beginnings of the company. We needed a way to go from a launch vehicle uh, in space down to the surface of the moon. And of course you need a lander for that. Um, so our lander Peregrine is designed to take uh, uh, up to 200 kilograms of, of payload to the surface of the moon. Uh, it uses uh, has four tanks, two fuel tanks, two oxidizer tanks. Mm -hmm. uh, they're they're liquid fuels in both of them. You mix that together uh, and it, it ignites. Um, and essentially, you aim that out of a rocket nozzle, uh, and that's what creates the rocket propulsion. So we have five main engines, 150 pound force thrust underneath uh, that provide the main braking force. We also have 12 attitude control thrusters uh, around the spacecraft, and those are essentially used to orient the big thrusters underneath. Um, the lander is uh, solar powered, so we're pointing the solar panel towards the sun to, to generate power to keep things warm and to operate the computer and everything else we need to get out to the moon. Um, once we get to the moon, we slow the vehicle down into lunar orbit uh, and descend down to the surface for a soft landing. Um, once on the surface, we become the local utility. So we provide power and communications for the payloads that come with us. Um, so we're, we're like the local infrastructure for the customers and, and payloads operating on the surface next to our lander. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. And I love how you describe that, like local utility. Totally. You know, you're the phone company, you're the electrical company, you're the, the sanitation company, other things like that, uh, <laughs> for whatever your payloads may need. So I never really thought about it like that before, where, where you really are providing those services uh, with it. So that is, that's so <laughs> No, that's really cool. It's a great way to describe it. So, yeah, totally. Um, and, you know, you are going to be carrying payloads to the surface of the moon with, uh, with your lander. So what is, what is Peregrine going to be carrying to the surface? We have 28 payloads flying with us on the first mission, and it's an array of science instruments, exploration instruments. We've got some marketing uh, things like time capsules and other stories. Oh, cool. um, we also have uh, a moon box uh, uh, shipments from individuals all over the world. Um, we have eight countries represented on our first mission. Um, we've got rovers, we've got science instruments, um, we've got precursor uh, instruments to, to uh, understand what the materials of the moon are. So it's a first precursor toward, toward creating that uh, the moon uh, uh, water fuel. Um, so there, there's a whole array of, of different instruments and, uh, and, and developments. I mean, you could kind of think about you know, the UPS truck or the DHL truck driving around in your neighborhood. Think about all of the different packages on the back of that truck and all the different stories that, that are attached to that. Um, that's a little bit like what we are. Uh, uh, what we are, we are that delivery truck uh, taking all the different uh, missions from all over the world uh, up to the surface of the moon. Speaking of stories, and not that this is broadcast live and nobody's watching, so you don't have to worry about that. What would you say your favorite payload is on Peregrine? Oh, favorite payload. That's that's hard. Um, I'll, I'll say a few of them. So, so what, one, uh, our goal as a company is to make the moon accessible to the world. Cool. Um, and uh, towards that, we have eight nations flying with us. Um, one of uh, one cool story uh, that I like to tell is the Mexican Space Agency. Mm. Um, they're a fairly small uh, new space agency, mm. um, but because they're flying with us, they could be the fourth nation to operate on the moon after China. Oh, that is and cool. And that's pretty darn cool yeah. for, for Mexico. Yeah. We also have a, a payload from, uh, from Nepal, uh, so literally the other side of the world. Um, there was an astronaut that climbed Mount Everest and brought a moon rock along with it. Um, and now Nepal is sending a moon rock uh, to the moon, or, or a piece of Everest, I should say, a piece of Everest to the moon. Um, so going full circle. Uh, so we are, we are touching the farthest reaches of the globe 
um, uh, with with our stories uh, and connection points to the moon. I, I also really like our, our moon box program. So this is designed for individuals to send payloads up to the surface of the moon, so small mementos. Um, so previously you had to be an Apollo astronaut to leave uh, anything on the surface of the moon. Uh, and now you can do that through our service. And we have some really cool stories in there. We've got uh, a school in the middle of the country uh, called Balco School, it's K through 12 school. Um, and uh, uh, traditionally they're, they're focused on agriculture, um, but now because uh, of our program, they're actually able to, to think about literally sending things to the moon and every, every kid in that uh, school is going to be sending a, a, a something up on an SD card that's going to go up to the moon. Um, so it's, uh, I, I just really like all of the human stories and the touch points all around the world that, uh, that, that we get to bring together on our mission. Yeah, and I saw on your website too, uh, I was kind of playing around with some of the, there's a configurator on your website uh, for it. I saw that you can literally launch your own personal payload to the moon for under 500 bucks. What? For that. That is ridiculous. That is so cool. That's practically it. So of. if you've got like a, reason, a reasonable amount of money, uh, you could launch, so you could literally send a payload to the moon. So, oh, that's really and cool. now I'm thinking about that. That's right. Hmm. What do I want to send to the yeah, moon? Yeah, it, it's exciting. We, we have a whole bunch of different uh, payloads inside there. We, some people will send inscriptions uh, to the surface of the moon on metal. Um, we have family photos in there, uh, like, like the astronaut um, uh, that, that, that left his family photo on the surface of the moon. Yeah. Uh, we have, we actually have some uh, um, uh, pet hair from a family pet that passed. Um, we've got uh, little little, uh, little mementos, really, that that are touch points to people, uh, and, and I think it's just kind of fun that you know if you can send something up to the moon, uh, your story will forever be intertwined with the you know what we all see in the night sky. Totally. Do you have something on uh, Peregrine, or are you planning something? I will. I, I haven't decided what yet. I, I have a, a short list, and I'll I'll make that decision right before we fly. Awesome. Oh, I love it. That's so amazing. That's such a great story. I love it. Okay, go. Cool. <laughs> um, um, so Peter Quinn uh, from our YouTube chat is asking, whereabouts are you planning to land on the moon? So we're going to land at a location in the north uh, east part of the moon. So it's the the upper right hand quadrant, as you see in the night sky. Mm -hmm. um, it's a it's a place called Lacus Mortis, um, and uh, for the Latin scholars out there, uh, you know that that translates to Lake of Death. Um, that sounds like a lovely place right to right. land. That's great. <laughs> I'm sure that was chosen for a very logical reason. Yes. Uh, if you wouldn't mind going into that a bit. <laughs> yeah, so it, it just so happens that uh, uh, Lacus Mortis is, is near a pit uh, at, at the moon, and, and pits can be entrances to caves under the moon. So it's a, it's a destination that could be interesting for, for the future. Sure. Um, and we found a nice, safe, flat landing site um, that's fairly benign, that, that's uh, off the equator, so it's a little bit cooler. Um, and, it, and it's a good place to go for, uh, for, for our first landing, trying to make it as easy as possible. Um, but in the future, we could return to this kind of site to uh, potentially explore these caves. And, and caves are amazing on the moon. And I, I think they don't get enough attention. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's probably the second greatest discovery on the moon after water um, because uh, it is a fundamental building block for uh, settling the moon. So if you have a cave, you have uh, shelter. And people settled in caves on Earth first for the exact same reason that we might settle on caves on the moon first. Um, when you're on the moon, you have radiation that comes from the sun. There's no magnetic sphere to deflect that radiation. Uh, but if you're underground, that can absorb that in, uh, uh, radiation before it, before it reaches you. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also meteorites that come down to the surface of the moon. Uh, on Earth, we have an atmosphere that burns them up, and we see you know, beautiful displays of, of uh, light in the night sky. On the moon, it's a little different. All those meteorites come straight down to the surface at orbital velocity. Um, but if you're under meters and meters of rock, it's, it's a pretty good place to be. Um, the other is the thermal extremes. The surface of the moon can get up to uh, 120 degrees Celsius or 250 degrees Fahrenheit during the day. That's the part you see lit at uh, night. Uh, and then it can get down to liquid nitrogen cold uh, overnight. And it's two weeks of light and two weeks of darkness. Um, mm. so that's a long period of really extreme temperatures. But if you're underground, it's one temperature that's fairly well regulated uh, throughout the day, just like being underground here on Earth. Um, so these caves could be the first place for, for people to settle on the moon. Um, and they're very, very large. Uh, NASA found one um, that they think could fit Philadelphia inside of it. Oh. Um, so there is more than enough room inside these things to build a settlement. Nice. Yeah. That, yeah. Well, let's that, just move Philadelphia there. Oh, so. Wow. 
why don't we do that real quick? So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I was just I was just thinking of the lake of death as well. You know, to land there, do you have to ask three questions or not? You know. Oh, see, and I, so, and I was thinking, yeah. like, the patch should have like a kind of a death metal sort of theme to it. <laughs> <laughs> but that's that's just kind of where my head goes with that because like you're gonna survive the lake of death. I yeah, think that's that's super that's super hardcore. <laughs> and Peter Sorry. Quinn on YouTube um, is asking sort of on the same point uh, regarding the landing area. Is it near caves? Is it near any any dead rovers or spacecraft that we have hmm. um, on the moon, or is it sort of like its own area that's been relatively unexplored? Yeah, so that, that location at, at Lacus Mortis is near one of the one of the pits, uh, which could be an entrance to a cave. And, and this one in particular is compelling because it, it looks like it partially collapsed. Um, and that's actually good because it creates a natural ramp to get down inside of it. Um, what we don't know is if it's collapsed enough that there's no entrance left uh, or if potentially you could get inside. Because the traditional um, thing that you'd have to do for these other pits is it's kind of like a sinkhole, like 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 what uh, appears in in Florida sometimes. Um, so it's just straight down drop for for uh, tens of meters. Um, so you would have to uh, descend down to get to the bottom before you could enter these caves. But if you could find a cave that has a collapsed entrance, uh, potentially that's a natural ramp to just drive straight down inside. Um, so that's what really drew us uh, directly to, to the Lacus Mortis um, uh, pit in particular. Um, so we're going to be landing in the vicinity. Uh, of that, uh, probably not close enough to see it uh, directly on the first mission, but we will have some some uh, low uh, low altitude imagery of it as we come in. Oh, awesome! Now, uh, from our chat room, there's actually two questions that I'm going to combine uh, together mm -hmm. real quick from two separate people. Uh, so, in our own chat room, Astro YYZ um, is asking: Are there rules? around putting things on the moon, because one person's memento could be another person's trash. Mm -hmm. And then Wicked, in our YouTube chat, is asking sort of in the same area, which is, do you think Apollo sites should be protected with a certain radius, no-go perimeter? Great question. So first is that um, there are protections for, for going to the moon. Uh, so to fly anything to space at, from the US, you have to get FAA approval. Um, you also, so the FAA will, will check all the other agencies like um, uh, NRO uh, and NOAA um, and, uh, and the DOD just to make sure that you're doing the right things up there. You're not, you're not weaponizing the moon, for example, that that's against the, the moon treaty. Um, uh, but, but otherwise, after that, um, then there's, there is no international law that, that governs the moon other than the, the moon treaty, which is, which is fairly, um, you know, based, based somewhat on the, the law of the sea. So there's like a non-interference uh, uh, agreement there. So around, around Apollo sites in particular, NASA has guidelines to say, hey, stay, stay away from these particular Apollo sites because we want to protect them because they're, they're historic sites and they should be protected for, uh, for, for uh, a very long time. Um, but we should probably pick one or two of them that we could learn scientifically um, uh, from. So it is one of the few locations on the moon where we um, have very, very, very good data about the materials and what occurred on those uh, locations. Um, and we could learn a lot about material degradation and, and what occurs over a long time um, after, after uh, having some kind of human presence on the moon. Um, in terms of leaving things on the moon for our missions, I, I actually think that our first several missions will be historic sites as well. Um, they are the first commercial landings on the moon. They will be uh, the first uh, landings for numerous uh, countries around the world. Um, but over time, maybe mission five through uh, and beyond, maybe it becomes a little more routine. Um, and at that point, uh, I think those landers are then eligible for reuse on the surface. Um, so anything that is man-made on the surface is incredibly valuable. So uh, future uh, uh, developers could use the fuel tanks, for example, to store uh, lunar fuel. Uh, they could take the metals, they could grind it up potentially, maybe make powder for 3D printing, for example. You could mm -hmm. take the, you know, the copper and reuse it on, on something else. So I think anything that's man-made up there is valuable, and the future missions will just be recycled. Um, and reuse. Uh, over time, though, we would like to get to the point where we can uh, ferry back and forth from the moon. Uh, and that's going to need the, the fuel at the poles of the moon uh, to provide uh, that, that fuel source to go back and forth from, from the moon up, up to lunar orbit and, uh, and just uh, create a ferry service down on the surface. 
Yeah, I like the idea of like stripping apart Moonlanders and like making your own with it, like a Franken, like a Franken craft or something like that. It's like Mad Max on the moon, though. So something like that. Yeah. So that'd be pretty entertaining to see what people would come up with. That is funny. With that. <laughs> All this just keeps, keeps reminding me of the, I think it was a Duncan Jones film uh, called Moon, um, that which if anyone hasn't seen, you should go see that because it's really amazing uh, with a really great soundtrack as well. Uh, yeah, but that's... That was really interesting. Uh, there's a question coming out of our chat room, uh, I'm sorry, from our YouTube chat room, from Luke S. Van Hote, I'm going to say. And Luke, I apologize if I have totally butchered your name, but are there any other spacecrafts where your company is working on or thinking about? Because uh, I know that uh, Peregrine is supposed to be launching, I believe it's in 2021, and I, you said with ULA, is that correct? That's right. So ULA is our is our partner um, right now for for launch, and and Peregrine is flying in 2021. So Peregrine can take about 200 kilograms to surface the moon. We have a, a larger lander that's twice the size of Peregrine called Griffin uh, that can carry up to 400 kilograms of payload to surface the moon. Um, we also have rovers in development. Uh, we have a planetary mobility department that is building small rovers that we call cube rovers um, that can carry uh, uh, small scales. Uh, uh, payloads, you could think a little bit like CubeSat, but uh, mobile on the surface of the moon. Um, we also have uh, mid-scale rovers. We, we just won a $5.6 million contract from NASA to develop a rover called Moon Ranger, um, which is about a 15-kilogram rover uh, for exploration and, and autonomy uh, development. And then we also have a larger-scale rover called Polaris uh, that can carry 90 kilograms of payload across the surface of the moon. That, that we like to think of as our pickup truck. Yeah. Um, so we can, uh, you know, screw payloads onto the back and drive around and, and, and take them around. And it's, it's amazing. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's not just that too that you guys are doing. It's not. Uh, it's not sort of these things you yourself are working on. You're actually working with NASA as well. Like you just won a commercial lunar payload services contract with NASA. And like, what does that entail for folks who may have never heard of the what we're calling now the CLIPS program? That's right. So uh, NASA created a, a, a very uh, forward-leaning program that I, th that I think could be a, a roadmap for other future uh, developments and, and ways to uh, push the bounds of, of, of space exploration and development. Uh, and it's called CLIPS, uh, Commercial Lunar Payload Services. Um, and what that is is a program for NASA to buy payload delivery to the moon as a service. Um, and that's really innovative because historically, uh, if they wanted to go to the moon or, or some other planetary destination, uh, they would put a mission together. They'd build a lander, they'd, they'd buy a launch, they'd put the payloads on to the, to the uh, uh, spacecraft, um, and they'd lump it all together in, in a big mission, and it might cost 250 to 500, maybe $750 million for, for, for this, this kind, of, uh, kind of mission. Um, instead, NASA says, hey, well, we have payloads and there's commercial providers out there. We're just going to pay for, for a ticket and pay for a ride to get those uh, uh, payloads up there. So it offers a, a much, much lower uh, price point for NASA, um, uh, and, uh, and and basically lets the commercial uh, providers optimize that delivery part um, uh, and make it make it regular uh, routine access for our nation's scientists and also access for, for the world uh, to to get to the moon on, on a routine regular basis. Very cool. So it's like it's like a TWA Moonliner, you know, flying from the Earth to the moon <laughs> and carrying whatever it needs to with it. So yeah, really cool. That's really cool. We um, we got word that your cube rover, as you mentioned earlier, was actually called Andy. Um, I imagine that there's a story behind that. <laughs> yeah. So one of our small rovers is is called Andy. Um, we're, we're partnered with Carnegie Mellon University, uh, and the the founder uh, of of, uh, of the Carnegie side is Andrew Carnegie. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, that, that's a big name here in Pittsburgh because he was a, a major steel magnate and one of the one of the great founders of of the city of Pittsburgh. Um, so uh, the, the rover is named Andy after uh, after after him. That's really. <laughs> That's really cute. I, I, like I that. adore that. I also, I love the concept of, as you say, Cube Rover based off of the CubeSat uh, idea, which is that, you know, that there's a specific size that it is going to be, that it can be, um, and that the modifications can come pretty easily based off of that size is my understanding. Yes? Exactly. Yeah. Our, our goal is the, the same thing with CubeSats. We want to make Cube Rovers uh, ubiquitous and easy for, for uh, folks all over the world. So we, we imagine universities and high schools and um, uh, small companies around the world could access the moon in a very affordable way using cube rovers. Um, and we, we've, uh, we've got a few things in the pipe on that, and we should have some cool announcements on that soon. 
Oh, that's really yeah, cool. Yeah, I'd love a cube rover to go drive it into one of the caves, see what's in, see what it looks like inside right? of there. So. Oh, yeah. 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 I, I would also love to see a, a student competition of cube rovers. Um, you could have some kind of terrestrial-based competition, and, and maybe there's a, a smaller group that gets to actually fly their, their rovers to the moon and you have a race on the moon. That um, <laughs> would like, just be awesome. Oh, yeah, the, really uh, awesome. Uh, the uh, Lake of Death 500 or something. Yes. With that there. So. It's like the best <laughs> yeah. name ever for that. Yeah, the Mario Tranquilla taught us 250 <laughs> so, this year, or the, the, uh, the Sinus Iridium Rally. So oh I, I'd go watch it. So Totally. <laughs> I want to participate in it. So oh my goodness, somebody yes. sponsor me. Let's make that happen. There you Anyways, go. Anyways, yeah. <laughs> we, we get off on a tangent. Don't mind us. Yeah. Don't um, so, so Wicked in, in YouTube chat is asking, um, do you intend to also build a relay satellite for the far side launches, or do you are you only focusing on the near side? So in the near term, we, we are focused on the near side, um, but we are um, in conversations with a couple partners that have interest in relay satellites. So um, that could open up far side landings for us. Uh, the other interesting thing that a relay satellite can do is it can provide a very uh, rudimentary GPS system. So there is no location system on the moon like, like we have here on Earth. Mm -hmm. um, so it is actually challenging. But if you have a few satellites in, in orbit, um, you can do a very basic GPS, uh, and that can provide even a, a, an additional service for, uh, for, for uh, things on the surface. So we are in conversation with a couple satellite companies on exactly that um, to start to build the infrastructure around the moon. Very cool. Uh, so <laughs> I'm only picking on this question because of who's asking it. Vax Hedrum in our chat room uh, that we know as our resident <laughs> Muna bomber. Um, <laughs> for, for you work on L Cross. <laughs> yes, so, thank you. Yeah. Uh, is asking, is Red Whitaker, Dr. Red Whitaker, still a part of Astrobotic? Yeah, uh, Red Whitaker is our founder. Um, and uh, with me, we, we started the company 12 years ago. Um, so Red Whitaker is a, is a professor at Carnegie Mellon, but he's still the chairman of Astrobotic. Um, and we work closely together on multiple programs. Uh, he's primarily focused on the rover side of, uh, of the developments right now. Um, so he is, for example, the chief scientist behind uh, the Moon Ranger rover, which is that mid-scale uh, rover for uh, exploration and, and autonomy development. Very cool. Yeah. Awesome. And like what's that. some stuff that's coming up that you can tell us about? Like, you got what's the exciting stuff on the horizon? That we don't have to wait another four years yeah. to have you on again to talk about, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think the most exciting thing is that we are uh, counting down to launch. Um, so we are uh, uh, making regular uh, steps in progress. We're, we're buying components. We're, we're, um, we, we will be booking a, a flight with a launch provider very, very imminently. Um, so we're going to see hardware coming together. We're going to see big milestones uh, around our, we're actually going to be building a, a new facility here in Pittsburgh, um, opening its doors probably early next year. Um, uh, we're going to have uh, rover developments and uh, lander developments and the pieces and parts of the mission are going to start coming together. Um, and, and I think we're going to, uh, it's just going to be an exciting time to, to watch the development and build of all, all of all of these things coming together. It's the dreams of the last 12 years uh, finally becoming a reality. That's amazing. And I assume uh, if you're building a new facility, then you are also hiring? Like, what kind of skill sets are you possibly looking for? We are. So we are scaling from a, around 20 people uh, up to about 60 people. Um, yes. we, have, we are well on our way right now uh, in that. Um, so we're looking for engineers of, of all uh, uh, disciplines, so mechanical, electrical, software, um, uh, V&V, &V, um, embedded systems, uh, integration and test, um, uh, you name it, we're, we're looking for it. Um, they, the, the, we are getting a lot of candidates and things are, are filling quite quickly, but um, uh, if there's engineers out there, we are hiring and, and send your resumes over. And just a real hypothetical question here. Um, if somebody <laughs> wanted to start up their own lunar lander company oh. like you guys did, um, what would be some of the real core pieces of advice that you would give them for, from what you've learned over the past 12 years? Mm -hmm. Well, I think one of the most important things to starting a space company is you have to have uh, passion and persistent passion. Mm -hmm. uh, in our case, we were you know, trying to build this thing for 12 years. We had our ups, downs, lefts and rights. There were multiple points uh, in our history where we probably should have gone under and given up. Um, but we didn't. Uh, we, we kept going, and, and it was really for the love of the game. It was the passion that got us through the, the bad times. Um, so you you have to love it. 
Um, there are, uh, if you're in space, you're in it for the love of the game. Uh, it, it's not a place to, you know, it's not like Wall Street where you're just going to make tons and tons of money. Um, this is this is a passion play, and everybody that we work with uh, is, is very, very passionate about, about what, what we're up to. Um, so that's really the, the key ingredient I think you need to have to, to start a, a, a space company. Awesome. That's amazing. Uh, as we are wrapping up, of course, in case anybody wants uh, to know more or get involved any in any way, um, where can people find out more information or follow Astrobotics process? You can check out our website at astrobotic.com. We also are on Facebook uh, and Twitter, um, and we have regular posts and updates there. Um, uh, and then, of course, if, if you want to join our mission, um, we've, we've got our DHL Moonbox program right on our website. Um, and for a few hundred dollars, you can send something to the surface of the moon. That's amazing. All right. Very, very cool. Yeah. John, thank you so much for joining us. Again, we are we have to have you on more than every mm -hmm. four years because yes. the things are really coming together and we want to make sure that we are getting the appropriate, uh, uh, what am I trying to say, progress report, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> like, we need to know more is really what I'm trying to say. And then maybe tomorrow we'll come together and uh, maybe we'll put something on the moon. Yeah, let's figure out what we can put in a box. Yes. Oh, my goodness. Put that there. So. Thank you so much for being with us, John. I well, really thank you so it. much for, for having me. It, it's an exciting time. And, and uh, you know, with the 50th anniversary of Apollo coming up, I think it's it's just such a perfect time to be thinking about the moon and, and what, what's next. A million percent. And, of course, we can't do all of this without you, the viewers, helping us out. And we want to thank all of our patrons of tomorrow. Uh, you can head on over to patreon.com slash tmro or now just just today announcing today announcing today you can head over to youtube.com slash tmro slash join where you can actually you know go through youtube if mm -hmm. you want to financially contribute to the show at the same tiers with the same rewards yep you so, don't just have to do through super chat anymore yep. mm -hmm. you don't if you don't like patreon for whatever reason mm -hmm. you just really love youtube then, yeah, please feel free. Yeah. We, <laughs> yeah and we, we can't do this without you. Yeah, we really can't. And it's amazing that we're able to do that. And we can't bring people like John on without your help to so be able cool. to do this as well. Um, so every little bit helps. And of course, uh, if you'd like to help us, but you can't contribute financially, that's great as well. You can head on over to community.tmro.tv. Mm -hmm. And that wraps up Orbit 12.22. Uh, we're really looking forward to next week's show because it's on the 50th anniversary of a Apollo 11's landing, so so good. Uh, so get your get your lunar gear out, get your moon shoes on, and uh, yes. moonwalk yourself into wherever you're going to have to go in order to watch the show <laughs> next week. So thanks for watching us, and until next week, we'll see you later. Bye bye. <laughs>